Hello everyone, welcome again to the channel. Today I want to share with you this uh, recent information I found on this website that I really like, that is called antiwar.com. So, in a summary, they are um, putting all the information that I have talked a few times uh, before in this channel about the um, current situation of the army of Ukraine, but they did it in a very, very good way. They put all the information together, so let's go to the highlights. Uh, so, as you know, there is uh, reports that the losses of the Ukrainian military are around 1,000 soldiers every day including soldiers killed and soldiers that are wounded. So the numbers are around this, um, around this sum. But the main thing is that um, these numbers, the reported numbers, uh, were reported both by the Daily Mail and by this other website that is called Axios. And the main thing is that they report this in the Donbass region. So, as you know, there are combat operations everywhere else in the in the country. So it's not only in the Donbass where there is the battle. So it is 1,000 soldiers dead in the Donbass. But there are um, combat operations in other parts. So. There is also military strikes with Russia in different parts of the country. So this is um, something very grim. But even if you just took the numbers uh, of um, 1,000 soldiers only taking in the Donbass, because we don't have the numbers for every other region, it's still the day uh, five months, so 150 days roughly, since the start of the special military operations. So that is in the range of 150,000 soldiers uh, dead or wounded, maybe more. So it is a big amount considering that uh, Ukraine doesn't have a navy. You know, the, this was already highly reported since the start of the special military operation, the, um, the Russian Air Force destroyed all the, all the Ukrainian Navy. And uh, of course we know from reports that the Russians lost two ships. Um, and one of them was uh, even resurfaced later. So that makes it only one actually. And uh, the Ukrainian military doesn't have an Air Force. Uh, they have a few fighter jets, if any, and the, while the Russian military has thousands of uh, fighter jets, so it is um, just uh, incomparable, you know, the, the Air Force of Russia is the second, the world's second most powerful Air Force, so it is uh, very significant. And then they talk about how the battle in the Donbass and everywhere else is being conducted. As you know, in all over Ukraine there are um, attacks with uh, missiles, especially with caliber missiles. Um, they, if you follow the reports of the Russian Ministry of Defense, they have blasted hundreds of Ukrainian munitions, warehouses, army barracks. So. When you hear reports from the Ukrainian military that they were starting to hit some some uh, munition warehouses from the Russians, there are very small numbers. So, of course, uh, every attack is significant, but it is not uh, changing the direction of the of the conflict. That's what I have always repeated. So they they do this here in a very very good way, and they also talk about uh, the artillery because we know that the artillery is where the the difference is being made. You know, they are sending uh, very small numbers of uh, artillery pieces, howitzers, and all kinds of uh, um, <clears throat> missile rocket uh, systems like the HIMARS, which are very small numbers. 
So, for example, they they have uh, this um, recent tendency that it has started with uh, how to say more becoming more evident in the this conflict where the artillery is using drones to spot places to, to shell. So the Russians have high numbers of drones and they are using them very effectively and they use different kinds of uh, artillery um, equipment for example this one that is called Krasnopal which can uh, hit uh, targets up to 40 kilometers far from the from the launch so because of this they have been able to destroy hundreds of military vehicles and they still have the typical artillery piece that is the 152 millimeter and they use it together with Orland 10 drones and they speak uh, some details about the Orland 10 drones but uh, what is interesting is this part here for example they say the Orland 10 remains airborne for 16 hours at 5 kilometer altitudes and is relaying the information up to 600 uh, kilometers away. So why is this drone relevant? If you remember there were some reports uh, uh, on my channel that um, I mentioned some drone jamming technology from uh, companies in Ukraine but if you remember the specifications these drone uh, jamming technologies work up to 800 meters maybe maximum one kilometer so these drones are flying at five kilometer altitudes well beyond the drone jamming so these operations will, will continue to operate you know and then they are using these msta howitzers and they are firing at positions up to 25 kilometers and these uh, remember that they say batteries that means they have four together they are firing and they say within one minute the MSTAs can simultaneously fire six rounds so they are firing 24 rounds and then they move to another place and uh, there was a report from the Russian information agency that in one day there were 157 of those uh, operations so you can see what is the extent of the um, attacks you know, when the Ukrainians claim to have taken uh, attacks for example recently on the breaches in Kherson region that was one single attack so imagine compare this with the Russians attacking 157 times so the difference is significant and um, especially because what they say here is the Russian experience zero casualties in these kind of operations so I he's recounting here probably numbers from the Russian Ministry of Defense I have several times mentioned it where they say how many tanks uh, how many armor vehicles how many unarmor vehicles artillery pieces multiple launch rocket systems drones helicopters and anti-aircraft systems they have destroyed and he says uh, here something that i already mentioned a few times but uh, it's good that he he confirms it he says that it is tally equals all the equipment the ukrainian army brought into this war so they don't have anything other than the recent uh, shipments that the NATO has provided or very little that they have left from whatever they had at the start. Initially the army, the Ukrainian army had 250,000 soldiers. But remember this, this is not, the army is not only numbers. It is where 250,000 trained soldiers, highly trained soldiers, they took eight years eight years to train 250,000 troops so yes of course in numbers you know Ukrainian um, Ukrainian population is very large they can enlist people in the army and they they have uh, reported that they enlisted already 1 million soldiers 
So that's people on paper that are willing to fight, uh, they are uh, ready, but they have the database of 1 million people and they say that they can even get to 2 million but it's untrained people, you know, untrained people will not be able to um, be effective. An effective soldier without training, it will, it will just uh, get killed, basically, that's what it is. And then we saw these uh, recent um, declarations from politicians like Dmitry Kuleva, who says that uh, there won't be peace talks after, uh, until the Russians have been defeated on the battlefield. And recently, this uh, uh, the Deputy Defense Minister Volodymyr Habrilov says that uh, he was going to sink the entire Russia's Black Sea Fleet and retake Crimea. So this is um, just nonsense, you know. It's uh, like this guy says is hallucinatory bombast, you know. Is uh, and this is repeated every day by Zelensky. He says that uh, he's not uh, willing to negotiate, but the reality is that uh, they say they are waiting for the Ukraine to have a stronger position in the negotiating table, but. Um, you need to see the tendency. The tendency is that uh, this is not going well for Ukraine and it's not going to improve no matter no matter what because of uh, the time it takes to train people. You know? So for example, as you know, this was a recent article from the New York Times where they are talking about uh, how they are signing up soldiers. You know? in Ukraine and there is a lot of reports about uh, how they are signing up people you know they say that officially they should only issue these uh, documents that are called summoned to only people who wants to fight you know so if they are not willing to fight they should not give them this document but they say that some people were complaining that they didn't give them a choice so it is um, <clears throat> a problem because if uh, they give this a summon to someone who doesn't want to fight, so it's going to be a problem for the morale of him and for everyone else, you know. For example, they provide here some stories about a guy named Dennis. He says he received a summon and he didn't want. And he says that he knows people who don't even leave their apartments because they are afraid to get a summons. And officially, there is an exempt category from the from this uh, pr process to enlist people. For example, if they are studying in a university, they have a disability, or they have uh, three children, they don't qualify. So, according to this, every person who is not in an exempt category, who is men age 18 to 60, uh, they can register or they should register with the local recruitment offices and they should undergo uh, medical screening for possible service. I don't know how many people actually did that. That is uh, kind of the requirement. And uh, they are saying that up to this point they are only recruiting people who already have previous military experience or they have some specific skills but uh, later will probably recruit everyone and anyone you know and because the military is in charge of the recruitment the registration and drafting the process is shrouded in secrecy with little transparency about standards applied to each step so nobody knows uh, how many people they want to recruit nobody knows how many have been recruited why uh, certain people are being recruited and others don't are not being recruited and there are even some people like lawyers like this uh, person Andrew Novak who says that um, they are illegal these summons that are being handed out to people on the streets they are illegal so he's uh, helping people who don't want to serve you know uh, to reject these uh, these documents <clears throat> And interestingly enough, there are some uh, telegram channels that are providing information to people to help them uh, deal with this uh, 
recruitment process. For example, in Kharkiv, there is a story. It will be funny if it was not really a tragedy. So there is this channel that is providing anonymous information about the locations of recruiters for people trying to steer clear of them. And it has more than 67,000 subscribers. This is the um, Telegram channel. You can see it. Um, you can find the link here in the article or I will provide it there also if you wanted to look at it. So this is a translation. So they are saying, you know, where they are finding people. They are providing the addresses, the times when they found people. They even mentioned the same article that I'm quoting to you where they were featured. And they say um, where people is finding uh, these uh, recruitment uh, places. You know, they are saying in this metro station, they are showing some documents that they were issued to them. So they are saying they are in, uh, in such a metro station. So what this means is uh, people don't want to serve. Uh, I am sure that a lot of people want to, but maybe not enough numbers. And um, there is also the fact that um, if people are being sent to the front lines and uh, they don't want to serve, this is going to cause a problem in the morale of all the people that is there in the front, you know. So this is causing also problems for people. For example, they give the story of this uh, guy whose name is uh, Volodymyr Marchenko. He says that he was already five months in a territorial defense battalion, often at or near the front lines without his unit being relieved. What it means is that they didn't give him rest. They didn't give him time to go back home, get some rest and then come back later or something. So they didn't change, you know, there was no rotation as they call it. So there is no one to replace us. There are too few people. It's very hard for the guys psychologically. Of course, imagine being 150 days in the battlefront is uh, is very difficult. And um, like they say, you know, it's difficult to tell how or why people are recruited. They are even recruiting people in who are committing uh, like a small small violations. For example, uh, there is um, a time when uh, nightclubs are supposed to be closed and because they found this in Kiev where two nightclubs were violating the curfew and all the people, all the men that were there, they give them this summon. So what this amounts is to some kind of punishment. So I'm sure that uh, all these people were probably unwilling to do it but they are doing these documents and this is causing all kinds of uh, morale lowering because people that is not willing are being summoned. They don't want to die. They don't want to participate. They are probably against the idea. So it's causing all kinds of problems, you know. They write this um, problem, you know, that uh, some of the people are creating problems for people who are already there, you know, in the front lines. So it's, um, it's just a big problem altogether, you know. Of course, in essence, um, what I wanted to say is uh, that um, the war is not going well for Ukraine. Like I repeatedly said, the Ukrainian army, the backbone of the Ukraine army, these 250,000 troops that were highly trained, already is destroyed. So this is not uh, going to change anytime soon. The army's capacity to fight will collapse suddenly. And the Ukrainian state should negotiate for peace. You know, this is the best solution. Peace is the solution for this. Uh, is uh, much better a peace deal than continuing the war, is my opinion. But of course, the Ukrainian politicians are not interested in this. So that's all I wanted to say for now. Let me know what you think about it. And as always, I want to remind you of the opportunity to support my work as content creator. 
In every video I include in the description the information about different platforms you can use to support me with donations. Additionally, you can support my work liking this video, sharing it in social media and subscribing to the channel. I hope to see you again very soon. Thank you for watching.